hardly anything more important than this, what we're talking about today. I encounter uh, different issues of theology and apologetics, the Christian life, but today it's basic, basic, basic. It's how to get saved, like how you, how you can have salvation through Jesus Christ. And this is the kind of thing where, you know, I could make so many videos and not think to cover this topic by itself. But today we're digging right in. Uh, what I want to do is I want to make sure that you understand clearly and understand well the gospel message at its core, uh, what Jesus did for us and how we can receive that, how we can actually be born again and, and have our lives transformed. And I'm going to describe some of those terms to you because some of that's going to be foreign to a few people. Uh, I want you to also be able to actually yeah, get saved. And now you don't need to know everything I'm going to share in this video in order to have salvation. So I'm going to, cause I'm going to explain things in a bit more detail than what is absolutely the bare minimum of what you have to know. Uh, there's a link in the description to like a one minute gospel presentation. So that we have that down below. There's like a one minute short brief presentation of the gospel, but I want to give you a detailed explanation, an understanding of this issue um, in much greater detail. I think that's really important to do. And I'm also going to do this. I'm going to pray with you at the end. If you want to pray right now live or as you're watching this video playback later on if you want to pray to receive christ to be saved you'll understand what you're doing here and then i'm going to take a moment to lead you in that opportunity to pray and so just hang on that will be toward the end here's the good news of the gospel in brief this is this is a fun topic to, to discuss it's the good news man this is this is what uh what gets us going and keeps us going it is the good news of god's incredible incredible love for you and for me and for all of us and his provision to give us forgiveness for our sins and an actual relationship with God, a real relationship with God that results in eternal life, eternal life with him forever and each other. And this is through Jesus, through faith in Jesus. That's us fulfilling our ultimate purpose. This is what God's created us for. This is what we've been designed for. We're like made for this kind of relationship and it's achieved through Christ. Now, there's one verse in the Bible in particular that I think just sort of like says it all. And so we're going to be looking at a bunch of Bible verses tonight, but I want to start with this one verse because I think Romans chapter 10, verse 9 gives us like a really good, simple boom. Here's the whole story. Here's the whole story of the gospel. And it's, some people make this way more complicated than it needs to be. Romans 10, 9 makes it real simple. So let me see if I can get the uh, Bible verse up here for you guys to look at and make it a little bigger. Romans 10, 9, this is the verse. It says right here, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I mean, the simplicity of the gospel is beautiful. Now it's, it's simple, but it's one of those things. It's almost like one of those, um, uh, I've seen them do these fractals where they zoom in and just, you just keep getting more and more detail as you keep zooming in. And that's kind of what the gospel is. It's this beautifully simple thing, but there's all this detail as we zoom in and we're going to zoom in tonight to understand this more, more carefully and more accurately. Like, what does it mean to confess with my mouth? What does that mean? Uh, what is it that I'm being saved from? And is that really all that I need to do? Is that really it? And, and it is, if you understand it properly. And what happens to me when I do this? Like what happens when I actually take the step of faith, what happens to me? So we're going to talk first about the issue of what we are saved from, what we're saved from. And uh, in order to do this, we're going to have to have an honest conversation about the issue of sin, uh, an honest conversation. I'm not here. Uh, I'm not going to be yelling at you. I'm not going to be you know, doing anything like that. Um, and I'm in the same boat as everyone else. In fact, that's the whole message. The, the bad news sort of precedes the good news when it comes to the gospel. I gave you the good news of salvation, but you're like, salvation from what? Well, that's the sin issue. That's the bad news. And we have to understand and comprehend the issue of our sin if we're to understand the cross, if we're to understand what believing in Jesus means and why we need forgiveness in the first place. Now, what is sin? Um, sometimes Christianese can get in the way here. And these, that would be words Christians are using a lot that maybe the world's not using. The world doesn't usually use the word sin. Uh, not typically, I don't think. I think that another way to put it would be moral wrongdoing, moral wrongdoing and sin, moral wrongdoing would refer to the internal acts of moral wrong. That is, that is in my, my fantasies. They're not just passing thoughts. Those aren't necessarily sinful behaviors, but it's fantasies in my mind, um, harboring things like bitterness or malice or hatred against other people, um, harboring lust, uh, those types of things that would be moral wrongdoing internally. 
Also, there's the external moral wrongdoing of sins, and you, you can name a list if you want of, of theft and lying, and um, you, you just name violence, uh, adultery, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on. The list is, never ends because we are always inventing new sins. Um, so it's moral wickedness. Now, the message of the gospel is to say, hey, um, before the, the, the cross saves you, you, you must realize that there is simply this condition we are all experiencing where we've all done moral wrongdoing. We've all committed sin. And this is much more significant than most of us realize. So a verse I want to take you to in the Bible, because this is, you know, Jesus, his, his gospel message is preserved here in the pages of the Bible. And it says right here, it is, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They become worthless. No one does good. No, not even one. Not even one that there's literally nobody who's out there just doing good, being a good, a quote, good person. Now, this is this hits people strangely because they think, but wait, no, but Mike, you're, I'm a good person. I mean, I'm a good person. Yeah, I have issues, but I'm a good person when it comes down to it. And I'd like to I'd like to um, help clarify what we mean by the issue of sin that we're not saying here that um, uh, every single thing that any any person has ever done has always been totally depraved and wicked. And I don't think that that's the message. Rather, we do need to see how bad we actually are, though. That That's the issue. We're not really seeing exactly how bad we are. Romans tells us that everyone sin and falls short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 here. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But people aren't realizing that this there's a connection here between sin and the glory of God. That is that my wicked behavior is being compared to something. It's being compared to God's glory. And it's in the light of God and his holiness and his glory that I realized that my sin is actually a much bigger issue than I previously realized because I was only comparing it to other people around me. And that's the mistake we make. We often compare our sins to other sinners around us. And so we don't feel like we're really all that sinful or all that bad or all that morally compromised. But in, in reality, we are. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, how big of a deal is it? Well, let me give you a, a fun analogy. <laughs> Hopefully I don't get copyright issues because of this. But th this is the, the freeze. This video I'm about to share with you is, the, is a guy named The Freeze. And he apparently shows up at Braves games or did. I don't know if he still does or not. And he suits up and he gets, and he's like a superhero, so to speak. And he races against a, uh, a person from the audience, from the stands. And they bring this guy out and they give this random dude a 200 foot lead. And then they let the freeze go and you'll watch the freeze, see if, if, uh, if he can beat the guy when the guy has a 200 foot lead. And this to me is a great illustration of us when we forget that we're being compared to God with our sin issues and not just to other sinners. So here, check this video out. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the audio on, but you see the guy running there here. He's right there. And then there's the freeze. Okay. He's coming. He's coming. And if you'll notice the guy doesn't realize he's being compared to the freeze. He's not aware of this, so he thinks he's doing pretty good. He looks like a slug to us, but he feels like he's doing good. He's going to celebrate early a little bit here in a second. There he goes. Look how great I am. Oh, oops. <laughs> so, and he eats it. I feel bad for that guy. He became a parable. <laughs> and he eats it. And the message is this. It's, it's that without realizing that the guy he was being compared to was that good, he was celebrating. He thought, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm wonderful. And this is what we do with our sin. I think, well, I'm not so bad. And I compare myself to other people who are also sinners, who are also morally compromised. And I don't realize that the one who I'm truly being compared to is holy, is God. And when I'm throwing my hands up, I'm a good person. If I look over my shoulder and I see God and his holiness and I go, whoa, Lord, you are holy. You're not just good. You're perfect. Perfect. Then I realize that I'm in a lot of trouble and I fall on my face, so to speak. And that's a healthy thing. This is not a bad thing. This is a healthy self-awareness. This is Christian self-awareness. I realize I'm actually a problematic sinner. This is this is the issue of sin. Now, how big of a deal is it? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, let me give you one, uh, not, not, not a uh, video from the internet, but let me give you scripture that helps us understand this. I think there's an illustration of this with Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was... A good person as far as people go so i don't mind using that phrase he was a good guy right but as far as people go but when he encountered god he realized in god's holiness that he had major sin problems and let's read through his experience his vision where he sees god and he realizes oh man i've got major sin issues and this is like one of the major steps we need to take as we're uh, accepting the gospel of christ 
In Isaiah 6, 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when they talk about God, they, they refer to God as holy, holy, holy. This is three times in a row the same word because they're trying to emphasize how incredibly holy. God is absolutely and totally perfect. He's morally flawless. He's perfect in every motive and in every action, in every way. He's perfect. But look at how that awareness of God's perfection, of God's moral goodness, how it affects Isaiah and how maybe it should affect you and me. It says, in the foundations of the threshold thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, and I said, woe is me for I am lost for I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah saw not only that he had sin issues, but when he saw how holy God was, he saw the sin of all the people around him too. He was like, we're all in so much trouble. What can be done? What can be done? And then God, of course, has a solution, which we're talking about today. The solution. I'm just here pointing out the problem. Uh, now, maybe you're already aware of, of sin issues in your life because God's given you a conscience. Uh, according to Romans 1, we see this, that God's giving us a conscience and the conscience is there to show us when what we're doing is good or when what we're doing is bad. Now, we can get a seared conscience or a hard conscience, but I think that if the Holy Spirit's working in your life right now, then you're aware of sin. It's, it doesn't, I don't have to beat you over the head to tell you about the sin issue. It's like you're aware of it naturally. You, you know that there's issues. You know that there's problems. You know that there's things that you, you're ashamed of. And if you, if you stood before God, it would be like, oh, woe is me. So you're already aware of this. Um, when you think of God, perhaps, or some, sometimes maybe if you try to pray and you become aware of the, of the guilt issues that are going on, this, is, this, this can be a bad thing if you stop there, but it can be a wake-up call to help us see that we've got sin issues. Um, it's even the Holy Spirit working in our life. It may in fact be God reaching out to you to show you that there's these sin problems that he wants to solve, but he wants you to be aware of them. You've got to know the diagnosis before you understand the cure, right? In John 16, 8, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit actually will convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And so we've got these, this awareness of like, oh, I have sin issues. And then there's the result of sin. So let's, let's talk about that, uh, for a second here. That's like the, the bad news, right? The, the sin of mankind and the result of this sin that comes upon us. Uh, the result is a few things. It's separation from God relationally. That's one of the results. Isaiah 59, two, God says to Israel, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And so that, you know, God, when we sin, we create separation from God. Now we, we get this in our relationships. Like if I sin against my wife, if I'm lie to her and I, I, and cruel to her, it's going to create relational separation. Not Maybe not physical exactly, but relational separation. And God's saying that this is the case with him, except the offenses against him are even worse because he's perfectly holy. And so it creates a relational separation. We see this in the Bible when Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden. This is a picture of the fact that sin, they eat of the forbidden fruit, sin causes a break in the relationship. That's one of the consequences. And when you come to Christ, when you receive Christ, this relationship is fixed. It is repaired. You enter into a real and healthy and right relationship with God. But before Christ, Colossians 1.21 tells us that we are alienated from God, that we're enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior. So that every thought of sin, every act of sin is, is a rejection ultimately of God himself. And that's the sad state of mankind. There's other consequences to sin, and that is, well, God is judge. Scripture teaches us that God is a holy and righteous and just judge. Common sense gets you to understand this as well, because you see it, you see uh, inequality, and you see wickedness, and you see cruelty in the world, and you think, God, you know, God's, God's got to get that person. God's got to deal with that person. God's got to come down on that guy. Like He can't just, just get away with it. If God is just, he'll deal with that sin. The, the other side of the coin is, but wait a minute, but I'm a sinner too. But I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a woman of unclean lips. Like I, I, I'm the one who has sin in my heart, sin in my life. God's going to deal with me too. And Jesus actually spoke about this a lot. I know a lot of people don't want to talk about these issues uh, nowadays, but this is, this is part of the gospel message is that there is final judgment where we're given perfect justice for our sin. And that is a, a scary reality. Jesus talked about it more than any of the other uh, people in the Bible actually talked about the issue of hell, the issue of judgment. And that is the, uh, the final future thing that's going to happen. We will stand before God and we will deal with our sins and be judged. And so it sounds like some pretty bad news, but this is only 
We're only here showing you what it is that Jesus fixes, the problem that Jesus is solving, the, the, the consequences Jesus is saving us from. This is what we're trying to understand here. Romans 6.23 puts it this way. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my wages, like the thing I've earned through sin, that would be death. And in the Bible, there's like, it's not just physical death. It's like separation from God and judgment and hell. That's what it's talking about in those contexts. So I have a great need and uh, my goodness just isn't going to do it. I'm, I'm not good enough. Like I've, I've already failed the test. I've already walked in intentional and purposeful sin. So then we get to the message of Jesus, where Jesus He's going to provide forgiveness through his death and resurrection. But here's where I think a lot of people already, um, they already get confused because sometimes people have like this sort of kindergarten version of Jesus in their head. And as they grow up and become an adult, they still keep that kindergarten level of understanding Jesus in their head. And this Jesus is a, is a mix, right? It's a mix of, of culture, cartoons, and misunderstandings that you've gathered throughout your life, perhaps. I'm amazed at how many people don't actually understand why Jesus was crucified. Like, what did it do? What his death on the cross accomplished for us? What was the purpose behind that? Why, why was this something that according to Jesus, it had to happen? He says he must be crucified. He must, and he must rise three days later that this like had to happen. So what was the purpose of it? Um, well, let me give you an illustration from the old Testament. And, and you don't need to know the old Testament to understand what I'm going to share with you. Cause I'm going to kind of catch you up. I think that what God does in the Old Testament is he frequently draws these long pictures, these big pictures using the people of, of, of the Old Testament in the historical events happening there. He draws pictures that are meant to like be sort of like a, an allegory of what Jesus ultimately does for us. And so here's an example of that. Um, and it has to do with the nation of Israel. So in the scripture, God calls one nation to be like his people, to be, to be faithful to him and he'll be, he'll be faithful to them, to be loyal to him and he'll be loyal to them. And they have this, this, this calling to walk in holiness and then God will bless them. And this is kind of like our situation right now. Hey, if you, if you live a perfect life, great, you're going to be great before God. But if you sin, there's going to be trouble. So Israel's given the law the law of the Old Testament. And this is something as a Christian, I'm not under the law, but I learned from the law. And the law of the Old Testament given to Israel was to show them ultimately that their failures morally. I know that sounds a little counterintuitive sometimes, but this is the purpose. So God gives them the law and he says, if you obey these rules and all these laws, I'll bless you. If you disobey them, I'll curse you. Then if you read on in the Old Testament, you see Israel, what do they do? They disobey over and over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, it's just a catalog of the failures of Israel, this, the disobedience to God's laws. And so they're going to have separation from God and they're going to have judgment from God. What did I say? The consequences of sin are separation and judgment. And these are the things they're going to experience. So what does God do? There's a solution. The solution is the sacrificial system of the Old Testament law. And so God says, I want to dwell with you, but I can't because you're wicked people. So you'll offer these sacrifices and these sacrifices will be things that are meant to pay for your sin, to create fellowship between me and you and to give you forgiveness for your sins. And that's the picture of that whole interchange of the two sort of sides of the law, the rules of what you have to do to obey and then the sacrifices that are there to pay for the disobedience, to create fellowship and connection with God and forgiveness. So this is what Jesus is doing. Jesus comes Jesus shows up and he's doing this for us, not in a picture in the Old Testament. He's doing this for for us in real time, in real life, and for all of the world. See, Israel here was just like, um, uh, they were just like a test case, in a sense, um, a, uh, a dress rehearsal, so to speak. Like, this is just meant to be a picture of what Jesus is going to come and do in reality. These animal sacrifices are just meant to be a demonstration of the kind of thing that Jesus is going to ultimately do for us. So Jesus comes and what does he do? He, he shows up, he lives a perfect, sinless life. He's the only truly good person. He's the freeze in this case. He successfully runs the race perfectly. He is perfect. And then he dies sacrificially. And that's the part of the cross I think people don't understand oftentimes. Is that Jesus on the cross, when I say he died for me, I mean he died sacrificially. Like he died in my place just like those sacrifices would be killed in the place of the offering of the offerer of the person bringing them in the old Testament times, Jesus comes and he says, I'm going in your place. I'm going to die for you. There's a, a verse where we can get this from Jesus himself. 
and it's in Matthew 26, 28. 